everybody and welcome to Mercury 80 and as you can see it's a fantastic day today glorious sunshine we're up in the 20s here so welcome let's have a wonder let's see what we've got up at the gifting site today well we've come in forest again from CEO's side and it's around about half past twelve, half past midday. Absolutely fantastic weather. It's really, really warm. One, two, three. That's a small foot. The heel is about there. So if I put my hand like that, hmm, it's just over the size of my hand. <laughs> I wonder if that is last week's peanut butter jar. Well, I'll pop it in my bag, take it with me. The animals have had that, so we'll just take that with me. So these are what they call signals. They refer to these as signals. Informations. And that one is facing north. And I guess that one is facing south. So that will be England in that direction. And, well, Edinburgh just up the road in that direction. Little baby signals down here. <laughs> Look at this. It's tiny. <laughs> but it's a letter. See? It's information. It's a glyph. So you've got one of these big breaks here. And here. I will have to ask about it. I think it'll be a local portal. And on that note, I should say, today, 
we do have international visitors here. So we have Anku. We have his brother Martom. We have his younger brother Pax. And Pax paid me a visit energetically the other evening. Wonderful. Um, it's really a great honour when these guys come and share their information and talk to you and teach you things you need to know. And that there, that's another glyph. So I'm very honoured to uh, have Anku's family come and say hello. It was quite a delegation that came. <laughs> Got lots of cracking over there. And Pax, as you may know, has had a little baby fairly recently. So, quite a conversation with him about his baby. So this is the old gifting area up here. So you get your bearings. Well this is our gifting tree and we have some bags. And we've got this one down here. There's a rip right across there, and they've pulled it. That's interesting. We've got another plastic bag here. You can feel the hole in there. There's a hole in the corner there. Another rip on here. And that one just had a hole, oh, two holes, quite large holes. Loads of paper for me to pick up today. But look at this, folks. Now, do you remember last week I brought a peanut butter jar and I said, I said, I'm not going to unscrew it. I'm going to leave it. So it's got a hole in there. Now, I think an animal has done that. Now, this was screwed on tight. Now, you know how tight jar lids can be. So they've carried the jar away, but they've actually opened it here. Now I don't know of any animal that thinks to itself, I'll just put my little paw paws on that lid and unscrew it. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Badger. Do you think, Mrs. Badger, I'll hold the bottom, honey, and you just unscrew the top. Okay, sweetie, let's get our peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> that is really interesting because I left that lid on really really tight I tightened it up from what it was fascinating so all our fruit has gone every bit of it has gone all the bags are empty so I will refill all of that so there we have some licorice, then some coloured jellies, then some Brazil nut pieces, and beside that some lovely walnuts, half walnuts. So that's for the peeps today. So on the tree today we've got some apples, these are pink lady apples. They're slightly pink in hue compared to 
to the Brayburn, which are more browny. Some more there. And that's, that's the last bag of apples. And then we have a mango. And another mango. <laughs> and all of the nuts and sweeties, they're all lined up there. And then the peanut butter again. And I can assure you that is as tight as can be. Um, I'll sort of show you. The seal, as you can see, is still on. So that's as tight as it can be. Now for some reason, they like to tear all of this. See the, the labels on here? They like to peel all of this label off. And I think it's these guys that do it. So I'm not sure what's underneath it, what they like about it. But there's, I've just picked up a whole lot of paper. And I think it's a bit like us, with beer bottles or Coke bottles. We sit and fiddle <laughs> and tear the paper off. And then it's a little something for the children. I did bring this one thing, and this is the only thing I've brought so far, which is a lovely, lovely, lovely bag of marbles. And they're all different colours. They're just small. I've told them not to eat them. So they're all different colours. Some blues, greens, and they're all in like a plastic sort of baggy thing on there. So they can just tear that open and take out what they need. The smell from that incense is amazing. I'm going to stick quite close to this until that's all burnt down. I mean the ground is still sodden, but it might, you know, I'd just like to make sure that they're completely extinguished before I leave. Okay, so we are just looking down onto the grounds in front of us, which belong to Sio, it's his area. And I thought I would tell you a little story. First of all, in an area that's sort of north of here, there's an old church. And to be honest, the church is in quite a state of disrepair. But I thought, it looks interesting, I'll have a wander around it. And the grounds were terrible, really. They were very, very boggy and very, very badly kept. The gravestones had fallen in some places. And it wasn't an old church. It, it looked a lot older than it actually was. So the church itself was probably about 150 years old. And inside this church, I have to say, it looked okay, it looked quite neat and tidy. But I wandered round to the back, in the back area of the church, and the grounds were all boggy. In fact, the crypt area had completely flooded which was a real shame, you know, you don't often find that, you know, usually churches are kept fairly well, but people do not go to church in the way they used to in this country. We've become far less observant than we used to be. So, later that evening, when I was coming away from there, and I got home, and I certainly felt like I was being shall we say, under attack from a very unpleasant energy. Now, given where I'd been during the day, I couldn't understand where I might have picked that energy up. And where on earth could I have got it from? But it was deeply unpleasant. In fact, it's the worst kind of thing I have ever felt in my life, to be honest. I have never felt anything like it. And I rang Rachel King up and she assisted me in all sorts of things that can help cleanse an area and protect me and I asked for a Hachidas 
assistance and right away she came with her back. Now they waited on the sidelines while another being who was female, um, I don't think it was one of their people, I think it was more of a great spiritual, they, she was described to me as a Mother Earth type of figure and very very serene looking female and she basically kept this entity whatever they were whatever this thing was she kept it all at bay and that was that and thanks to the people they were amazing how they the way they protected me I cannot tell you um, Abak there and his family put point men on all my doors. I was protected. Um, they told me I was one of the most protected people around now. Um, and it's a very, very safe feeling. So these guys, they do. They do some amazing stuff. Further on to that, I decided to have a conversation. Um, Ahachida had given me a, a brief bit of information about the area, but I spoke to Athenian, who is certainly a sage, a very, very wise female, an elder, and I spoke to her about the energy concerned and the ground. And when I sort of mentioned earlier, oh, a couple of months ago, about you know, being in a church, surely it should be a safe area. And I can remember Ahachida said to me, where better place to hide? Which is quite true. If you are a, a dark entity, an evil spirit, that's a place to go. But it had nothing to do with the church. It was all to do with the ground. So she'd mentioned that this was feudal, very, very feudal area from about the 1300s, that period of time. So what I understand happened is that there are two families. And those two families were at war between each other to do with their grounds and their land. And one of the families decided to do a night attack on the others while they were sleeping. In the 1300s, times were very barbaric, and this family decided to attack the others at night time. So in order, they needed to kill everybody that was there so that they wouldn't be able to revenge attack them. So they did, they attacked them all in the night, and they went one step further. They decided they would kill all the women and children so that family could no longer reproduce. Which is a dreadful, dreadful thing to do. And this was the start of skirmishes that went on for quite a period of time. So they describe it as being 150 years of bloodshed and blood-soaked ground. And what happened the other family that were attacked, the remainders of them, went back to the first family and they attacked them. And this continued. Now in the initial attack, all the offspring and the women were slaughtered. This was so they could no longer reproduce and their family line would die out. It's pretty, pretty vile stuff, isn't it? So their revenge was to do the same to the male men of the other family. And they made sure, I don't need to go into detail because guys, you're going to cross your legs. But they made sure that they would not produce, reproduce anymore in their family. Absolutely vile times. So the entities that control that sort of stuff, the energies that control that, are not good sources. They come from the darkest pits of evil you can imagine. 
and that energy still resides. 150 years of bloodshed, so that went on to the mid 1400s, early 1500s. So this ground is very, very feudal. Um, and I did ask if it was one of the reasons why they built the church there. And I think I got a confirmation of that. I also wondered if it was one of the reasons why the family stayed here, why they settled here. But there was another reason given for that. And Abak Senior, so Abak who we talk to, this is his grandfather, if you remember, he transitioned in January this year. Well, Abak Senior, he has a sister. Now, his sister's name is Jackazil. J-A-Q-A-Z-I-L. And Jackazil's main um, discipline, if you like, well, she was a meteorologist, so she is one that can control and assist with the weather. Now, sometimes they can bring in storms and wind and breeze, and we've seen that recently on uh, Arkansas Bigfoot's video, where they control and influence the weather. Is that not remarkable? A back senior... He was 108 when he transitioned and he spent most of his time in his essence, essence state. So I'm kind of guessing that somebody as grand an age as Jacquesil, who I really would like to acknowledge today, because she is the matriarch of the family now. And an amazing female. 112 years old and I'd love to acknowledge her and without her approval I guess that a lot of this would not be possible as well so Jacques Ozil's mate was called Denari and he was 92 when he transitioned in 1988 so he was born in 1892 um, so they had ten children and seven survived. There is about to be a baby born soon to Sarada, who is Ahachida's daughter, Ahachida and, and Edgar's daughter. And when that baby is born, Jacquesil will be present at the ceremony. She welcomes the baby into the world. She welcomes it to the family. And I think that's lovely that the oldest member of the family does that. So, there we are. Jacquesil, what an amazing female. It's a great honour, great, great honour to know, know of her. So I wonder if at any stage within this, if Sarada's new baby will carry Jacquesil's name, if she is a female.
So with that folks, we'll leave it here for this week. And everybody just stay safe, be kind to one another, be kind in word, thought and deed. And just enjoy this wonderful weather. So bye for now folks. Bye.